Well, here we are again, uh, a new year, an election year. You are with me in my office here at Berkeley, and uh, this is a live feed. Now, the purpose of the live feed, for those of you who have not joined before, is to give you an opportunity to ask me questions, uh, me a little bit of an opportunity to sound off live, uh, also to give you my picks for best movies, best books, things like that, and basically to have a half hour where we can kind of share our views. This is unusual. I mean, this is live. This is real. And this election year, it's going to be important. Many of you have suggested we do this every week at the same time. And so we're going to try to do that every week at the same time. It's going to be 12, uh, 12 noon Western, that is Pacific time. And on the East Coast, it'll be 3 p.m. And then if you're between the East and West Coast, uh, Central and, uh, and Mountain time accordingly. Uh, so topics today, uh, in the first third of our half hour, um, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about, um, first of all, the debates, and secondly, guns, and thirdly, banks. Now, several of you have written in already, you're a little bit concerned about what's happening in China, and you have a right to be concerned, because uh, economically, uh, the Chinese stock market dropped 7% this morning, and the repercussions are huge. Already oil prices have plummeted. They started plummeting before. Uh, if you would like to ask any questions about the effects of what's happening in China and the Chinese economy on the United States and for you, I won't get into them now, but please do uh, sort of write in or send in a question, and we'll get to it later. Uh, but with regard to the democratic debates, or the debates in general, uh, debates are big deals, not simply for the people who tune in and listen to them, but also for the media. The press reports on what's said in the debates. And the fact of the matter is that the Republicans have twice as many debates scheduled, all told, as the Democrats. This is my little, my little visual aid here. Can you see? Uh, this is Republicans, twice as many debates as Democrats, and also the Rep Rep Republican debates have been in prime time. Uh, they've been on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and the Democratic debates so far have all been hidden away on weekends. Uh, Saturdays, that was the last one, Saturday before Christmas. Uh, the next one coming up on January, I think it's January 12th, am I right? I think it is January 12th, but it's, it's going to, or January 17th. It's on a three-day weekend. Uh, it's going to be Sunday when the NFL playoffs are occurring. Now, here's the problem. Uh, some Bernie Sanders supporters say this is a plot by the Democratic National Committee uh, to hide the debates and not give Bernie Sanders an opportunity to take on Hillary Clinton. That may be the case, but there is a larger and more important issue here, which is why I started a little petition. We already have over 100,000, 115,000 people who are asking the Democratic National Committee to schedule more debates. The bigger issue here is that the Republicans are getting a lot of free airtime for their garbage, their brainless hatefulness. I mean, they're basically, if you just watch the Republican debates or watch the coverage or listen to the coverage or watch the newspapers, read the newspapers, you would think that the biggest issues facing this country right now are repealing Obamacare or how bad President Obama has been as a commander in chief uh, or uh, you know that there's, there's a flood of Syrian refugees coming in and Mexicans coming in and we've got to man the borders and we've got to get rid of illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants inside the United States. In other words, the shaping of the debate, including the economic issues. We've got to reduce taxes on the rich and that kind of Reaganomic supply-side baloney. You would think that all of that was dominating American politics and the most important things that could be talked about in American politics. Well, the fact of the matter is, the only reason you think that is because the Democrats have had so few debates and the Republicans with their garbage have had so many debates and so much coverage. What we need to do is have more democratic debates. And that means that people can understand that the real issues the country faces have to do with stagnant wages and jobs that are still going nowhere. We still have a, a very low, 40 year, almost 40 year record low percentage of people who are of working age who are actually in jobs. 
Uh, we have uh, CEOs earning 300 times what the average worker is earning. We've got widening inequality. Poor people cannot get into the middle class because the middle class is shrinking. Those are the issues we ought to be talking about, including widening economic inequality, an on-demand economy that is basically generating larger and larger economic insecurity. Now, the f reason that we're not all talking about this, and the media is not saying these are the central issues in the campaign, has a lot to do with a lack of democratic debate. So please join me in my petition to the DNC. The reason a petition works is because a petition, when you get enough people writing that kind of petition, it generates news stories. And I've already been on uh, kind of on the phone with members of the press, and those news stories put pressure on uh, Debbie Washington uh, Schultz and the Democratic National Committee to make some changes, or at least think about making some changes. All right. Let me just say something on, on guns. And, uh, and this is really important. I mean, the, the president is going to be talking, he's going to be having a town hall meeting tonight about guns. He's already had a, a news conference, which I don't know about you, I found it to be an extraordinarily moving Moves, a news conference uh, because the president was so emotionally present uh, and we all need to be emotionally present and aware of what's going on. A lot of people say, oh, you can't do anything about guns. Well, have you ever been to Australia? Well, let me tell you a little bit about Australia. Uh, I've been there four times. Australia, of all the countries I've ever been to, Australia more resembles the United States, even more than Canada, in terms of Australia's Wild West kind of individualist mentality. But Australia in 1996 had a tragic mass shooting in Tasmania. Uh, and that galvanized political action. The conservative government, prime minister, uh, in Australia at the time, uh, just about two months, or maybe two and a half months after the mass killing, got through the Australian Parliament a measure that required that all gun owners register, that anybody purchasing a firearm uh, provide a good reason why they needed it, but more importantly, that had a mandatory buyback, financed by the government, of every automatic and semi-automatic weapon. Now, what was the result of that? What was the result? I mean, everybody who says, you can't do it in the United States, you shouldn't even try, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Let me just show you. The result in Australia, homicides down 50, 42 percent. Suicides down 57 percent. Now, if Australia can do it, the United States can do it. We should be talking about doing it, not just, yes, it's important to have uh, kind of background checks on everybody, yes, absolutely. But let's also think about following the example of Australia. Uh, in terms of the banks, the third issue I want to talk to you, uh, just to get things going and get it off my chest. Um, earlier this week, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, suggested some major banking reforms, uh, said that Hillary had not, Hillary Rodham Clinton had not gone nearly as far. Uh, he is right. Uh, the two things that need to be done, above all else, are to bust up the big banks and to resurrect the Glass-Steagall Act that used to separate investment from commercial banking. Bernie Sanders wants to do both of those. Uh, Hillary Clinton has not yet bought on to doing them. But let me show you why it's so important. Another one of my visual aids, um, the five biggest Wall Street banks. Okay, in 1990, the five biggest Wall Street banks had 10% of all banking assets. By the year 2000, the five biggest Wall Street banks had 25% of all banking assets. And then, of course, you remember in 2008, 2007, came the horrendous uh, bank, uh, too big to fail, bailout, and all of the rest. I mean, people losing jobs and homes and savings. Uh, we don't want to go through that again, but just remember, 2000, the big banks had 25% of banking assets. Now, what do they have now after we went through that horrendous crisis? Take a guess. Today, the five biggest banks have 45% of all banking assets. If they were too big to fail before, they are way too big to fail now. I mean, obviously, 
we've got to bust them up. This is Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, in uh, you know 1903, I think the year was, he busted up the Standard Oil Trust. He used antitrust law. That's what we have done historically to bust up big concentrations of economic power uh, that are dangerous for the country. And we ought to bust up the big banks. And some, even CEOs of big banks, agree. The reason this has not happened, by the way, and the reason that you haven't resurrected the Glass-Steagall Act, which is also very important because by separating commercial from investment banking you don't get into the world of finagles uh, and by finagles I simply mean all of the ways in which these big banks have figured out uh, how to use commercial insured deposits and gamble with them. Uh, they should be separated completely. There should not be any commingling uh, and we can do it. We should do it. The reason it hasn't been done is because of the political power of the giant banks. Uh, I was in Washington. I saw it. Uh, the, uh, the big banks uh, make not only campaign contributions, uh, their lobbyists are all over Capitol Hill. At this moment, uh, they are there on Capitol Hill trying continually uh, to water down the Dodd-Frank bill, which we uh, act, which was the only thing we have now standing between us and another big bank failure, and it continues to be watered down uh, because of the big banks. So what we need to do is bust up the big banks and resurrect Glass-Steagall. Can I make that clear? Have I made it clear? Okay. Um, just before we get to, actually I want to move on to the picks, picks of the week. Uh, now, this is the portion of our little audio where I give you my suggestions on what to see. Uh, the Golden Globe Awards are coming up Sunday, and uh, I don't know. I love miniseries, you know, mini TV series. Do you? Um, and the, my favorite mini TV series uh, is Wolf Hall. You don't know it. Okay, try to get it, get a hold of it. It was, uh, it's, it's wonderful. It's based on Hilary Mantel's uh, two-volume work. Uh, the first volume was called Wolf Hall. The second was Bringing Up the Bodies. It's about Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell. Oh, I know, you, I can just see you saying, oh, Henry VIII, I don't care about Henry VIII. This is contemporary politics. Thomas Cromwell uh, in the 16th century was about the best political operator behind the scenes uh, we have ever had certainly in the Anglo-Saxon historical world. Uh, and there are a lot of Thomas Cromwell, there are a few Thomas Cromwells in Washington today who have the same skills. I have come across them, they are rare, uh, they are bloodless, uh, a lot of people are basically killed without knowing it, politically, metaphorically. You know, a stab wound goes in and it comes out and you don't even know you're bleeding until about an hour later. Uh, Thomas Cromwell was brilliant, um, and um, if you want to understand politics and you want to see great, great movies and also a great miniseries, but also read a great book, two books, Hilary Mantel, it's fabulous. I really, I, I just finished bringing up the bodies and I couldn't be more enthusiastic. Uh, the other movie I wanted to bring to your attention was The Big Short. Uh, it is, uh, if you want to understand the banking crisis, why it's so important uh, to bust up the big banks, why it's so important to resurrect Glass-Steagall, the Big Short is important for you. Another pick. Two picks. Oh, right, I right. You know it was predictable. Uh, this is a movie uh, Jake Kornbluth directed and I had something to do with. Uh, and if you wanted to understand what's going on and why we ought to be talking about the things we are, we're not talking about as much as we should be talking about Bernie is, uh, and also <laughs> this one, this book. All right. So those are my picks, um, and uh, I'm ready for your questions. And we have a we have your questions. Your questions are coming right here. Please do not waste time. The people are out there waiting breathlessly. Okay, Claire uh, uh, Fear Gale writes: uh, the widening gap between the top one percent and the ninety nine percent is a global issue. Can you suggest? an easy to understand explanation to get this message across. Well, Claire, um, first of all, uh, yes, almost every nation, every, uh, every advanced economy is moving toward greater inequality. 
the United States, though, is moving toward greater inequality faster than anybody else. We are the outlier. We are the most unequal of all advanced nations. In fact, we're the most unequal of about, of about 36 nations uh, that are both advanced and also developing nations. Um, it's happening partly because of globalization and technological change. Uh, and I used to write about this a lot, and I can give you some recommendations. But one of the biggest factors in the United States is the interaction between wealth and power. If you've got a lot of wealth, big corporation, big Wall Street bank, billionaires, you have a lot of political power. And that political power means not only can you get tax cuts and subsidies, but you can also change the rules of the game uh, to advantage you and people like you and disadvantage the middle class and the poor. And that's what has been going on. Next question. Uh, Whitney Sharp asks, do you think Ted Cruz is eligible to be president? <laughs> well, I'm not going to vote for him, Whitney. <clears throat> uh, but technically, is he eligible? Yes, he's eligible because he is. Um, he was born uh, of an American citizen, uh, so he was at, at, at birth. He was uh, a, uh, a natural-born American. If you were born of an American citizen, wherever you are, you are a natural-born American. Uh, and the Constitution has, is pretty clear about this. You're not naturalized. You are natural-born. Uh, and the Supreme Court has not dealt with this, but what, what are we talking about this for? Because of why? Because, uh, because Donald Trump wants to make a big deal out of this? Uh, Ari Deitch. Uh, can you explain the major differences between Bernie and Hillary with respect to their policies on Wall Street and the financial system? Well, I did a little bit. Let me get into a little bit more detail. Uh, Hillary does not want to resurrect Glass-Steagall, does not want to bust up the big banks. She does also does not want a speculation tax. Bernie is talking about a, a tax, a small tax, on every Wall Street transaction that is a speculative transaction uh, that would generate a lot of money. We know this. Uh, and that money could be used for, for example, financing free college education for people. Uh, it's a good idea. Uh, those transactions, you want to throw a little bit of sand uh, in the wheels of Wall Street. Uh, and this is not a new idea. In fact, uh, one of the Council of Economic Advisors members under John F. Kennedy came up with the idea. James Tobin was his name. We've talked for years in economic circles about a Tobin tax. This is exactly what Bernie is suggesting. Hillary doesn't want it. Bernie does. It's a good idea. Next. Uh, David uh, McDevitt, 2016 is so much more than the presidential race. How do you propose changing Congress to support the new president? Uh, David, when we are in a vicious cycle of wealth and power, where wealth is generating power uh, to change the rules of the game, and those rules of the game changes are generating more wealth at the top, the only thing that is going to really change anything is not policies. I can sit here and give you a dozen great policies, but they are meaningless without enough power to implement those policies. Uh, so we've got to have a citizen's movement, a mass citizen's movement. It has happened four times before in our nation's history. It happened under the Jacksonians. It happened uh, in the progressive era between 1901 and 1916. Uh, it happened in the 1930s. Uh, it happened to some extent in the 1960s. The Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Medicare, Medicaid, the Environmental Protection Act at the end of the 60s. Uh, so it can happen, but only when people are mobilized and energized and organized, and a lot of people. And we are getting to that tipping point. I think uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign, uh, the Fight for 15, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, they're all symptomatic of us getting to that kind of broad-based citizens' movement. Uh, okay, Richard Weisham, if elected, what tools will Sanders have to face lo larger banks to split Oh, uh, to force larger banks to split up? Uh, well, a president, any president, and uh, Hillary Clinton or any president could do this. Uh, the, right now, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, and the Fed have enough power between them to force the big banks to split up. Uh, you don't need an act of Congress. Uh, you could also find that kind of antitrust authority, arguably, at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, so Bernie can do it. Any president can do it. Next question. 
Uh, Crystal English asks, what about the Chinese markets? Well, I thought you'd never ask, Crystal. Uh, I started talking about China. Uh, look, here's the problem, and here's how it affects you. Uh, because as the Chinese uh, stock market uh, begins to collapse, it's not going to collapse entirely, but as it begins to adjust downward, uh, what people are going to start realizing, and a lot of us have realized it for some time, is that the data we have out of China about the statistics uh, that China is supposedly basing its economic success on uh, really are very shaky. Uh, there is huge amounts of debt in China. Uh, China's growth is based upon a little bit, or maybe much more, than a bubble. Well, how does this affect you? Because we have a lot of big American companies that are investing in China, like MAD. In fact, a lot of big companies from the United States, headquartered in the United States, with American shareholders and American debt owed to American banks, get it? Uh, those big companies have more employees in China, more consumers in China, than they do in the United States. So the American economy is very linked to the Chinese economy. Developing nations also are sending commodities, uh, every kind of commodity, oil and copper and minerals and wood and, and, and farm uh, 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 crops uh, to China. And if they, those developing uh, countries, don't have that kind of outlet, that also affects us. It affects our banking sector. It affects our big corporations. It affects uh, the United States' ability to export. So the ripple effects in every direction. Next question. Uh, Mike Wilson, even if Sanders is elected, can he get anything done if Congress opposes him at every turn? Uh, well, listen, Mike, um, let me just say this. Uh, the only way Bernie Sanders is going to be elected is if there is a mass citizen movement to elect him. And that same mass citizen movement, uh, a lot of people organized and mobilized, energized, uh, is going to change Congress. In other words, <laughs> Bernie Sanders is the output of what kind of political revolution we need in this country to change the status quo. Uh, if he's elected, that will be a, uh, a major indication that we uh, have reached that tipping point and Congress will be different, or Congress will feel the effects of that change. Next question. Uh, Paul Barnett, what do you make of the stock market fall today? Well, it is related. Uh, to what happened uh, in China. I think there's also the case in the United States, uh, and the people are catching on to this. Uh, you have a middle class that is shrinking. With a shrinking middle class, since 70% of the demand in the American economy for goods and services comes from American consumers, a shrinking middle class that doesn't have the cash to buy all the goods and services we're capable of producing, uh, well, that's scary. That means that uh, there's not enough economic activity to generate momentum in this country. And on top of that, you've got the Fed, uh, for reasons that I frankly don't understand, raising interest rates at a time when it shouldn't be raising interest rates. We've got people at the Fed who believe that there's something called inflation. Well, look under your bed, look under your pillow, look under the door. There's no inflation. You can't find inflation anywhere. There is no inflation. Why the Fed is raising interest rates, slowing the economy at this time, is another uh, imponderable, but it is working against jobs and wages and against average people. All right, next question. Uh, John Chaikold, uh, what should I be doing as a private citizen to further the cause of economic and social justice for all? Uh, big question. Jan, is it Jan or John? Jan. Big question, Jan. I think that what you ought to be doing, and I'll talk more about this in the future, we're going to be doing a, a bunch of videos about this, but citizenship is more than just paying your taxes, serving on juries, and voting. Do all of those, especially vote. Uh, but you also have to be engaged. Uh, engage with people around you. I, I mean, look up uh, the people who are running for Congress uh, in your district or in districts around you. Get involved in a campaign of somebody you believe in. Get involved in a presidential campaign of somebody you believe in. Uh, take time away. People say, I don't have the time. You do have the time. You're watching television. Are you? Jan? Yes, of course you're watching television. You can take just, just take an hour a day and get on the phone, do political work, get people out to vote. Uh, you know, uh, or 
do what I have sometimes done in my life, and that is just stop what I am doing and go to primary states and help organize. All right? Uh, Douglas Taylor, what do you think is the greatest policy change we need to fight income inequality? Uh, Doug, the number one policy change we need to fight income inequality is to get big money out of politics. Uh, that means reversing Citizens United, uh, and in the meantime, before we do that, it means uh, public financing of elections, it means uh, making sure that we know full disclosure of all the sources of campaign finance, uh, it means public pressure uh, building against candidates that have big super PACs and they're taking a lot of money, uh, it means that uh, uh, you, want to have, you want to pressure, if you're a shareholder of any company, join other shareholders and pressure that company to disclose to you how much that company is contributing of your money, it is your money, into presidential elections or other political activities. Uh, you know, you ought to know. It's your right. Okay, we have time for two more questions. All right, Mitchell Kaiser asks, can anyone other than Wasserman Schultz change how many debates there are? You mean Washington, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who is the chair of the Democratic National Committee? Well, the DNC is not the only entity that can uh, have a, a national debate, uh, but it is very hard to get the media coverage uh, of any kind of forum that is put on by uh, private groups. Uh, so the easiest way of getting more debates, the most direct way of getting the kind of debates that are going to get the media coverage that gets the right issues out there is through the DNC. Final question. And here it comes. The big question. Shh. I hope this is this ought to be a very important question because this is the end of our... Uh, okay, Deborah Harrison. Why is no one talking about the effect of the next president on the Supreme Court? Well, I'm talking about it. This is a huge issue. And Deborah, I'm glad you brought it up because the next president over, uh, let's assume the next president has an eight year, that is, is reelected, has an eight year span of time as president. That is likely to, over the next eight years, given the age of the Supreme Court justices who are there right now, the likelihood, just looking at demographics, the likelihood is that that president is going to have four Supreme Court appointees over the next eight years. Four Supreme Court appointees. There are nine members of the Supreme Court. Five of them right now are Republicans. Uh, well, that's a huge opportunity to reshape the Supreme Court, uh, to get rid of a Republican majority that wants to take us back into the pre-New Deal era and have a majority like the Warren Court that we had in the 1950s uh, that really did see the future and lead the way into the future. Uh, so. It's a big deal. It's important. Uh, look, we don't have any more time. Let me just remind you, next t next week, at this time, uh, 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, and Mountain and Central between the two, we're going to do this again. Um, I hope it works. I hope it's helpful to you. We're going to the issues of the day, economic, political. I'll give you my picks for the week, uh, and maybe a little bit of graphics. Uh, maybe I'll do some cartoons. See you next week.